I received a request to do a reaction video of a video or videos by Sabina Husselfelder. Now, I want to say first off that I really admire her that she's willing to point out problems with the standard model and I think she does a great job with what she talks about but unfortunately she's still stuck in a lot of bad theories and so this first video I'm going to do is on a neutrino visit video that she did recently where she talked about a problem that they found a Six Sigma error in neutrino theory that was discovered in 2018 or reaffirmed in 2018 and reached Six Sigma and it basically says that the standard model is invalid and she does a great job explaining it so I'll let her do most of the explaining. Now I do want to make one caveat. Neutrino theory is a logical impossibility and that's because of the cold dark neutrino death problem that you have with neutrino theory and the universe that if you have an infinite universe eventually all the matter would turn into neutrinos and the universe would die a cold, cold neutrino death. So it can't happen that way and what we have to do is replace neutrino theory with a the theory where there's a field of energy and that when we have weak interactions like beta decay that energy can be borrowed by matter and then in other interactions returned to the field and of course the field I'm talking about is the quantum field but with that caveat I'll go ahead and let her explain the basics and I trimmed a lot of sections but this gives you just the outline in the past months, we've talked a lot about topics that receive more attention than they deserve. Today I want to talk about a topic that doesn't receive the attention it deserves. That's a 20 years old anomaly in neutrino physics, which has been above the discovery threshold since 2018, but chances are you've never even heard of it. What's even weirder is that the three types of neutrino flavors mix into each other. That means if you start with, say, only electron neutrinos, they'll convert into new neutrinos as they travel. And then they'll convert back into electron neutrinos. So depending on what distance from a source you make a measurement, you'll get more electron neutrinos or more mu neutrinos. Crazy, but it's true. We have a lot of evidence that this actually happens and indeed a Nobel Prize was awarded for this in 2011. By 2005 or so, physicists had pretty much pinned down all the parameters. Except there was one experiment which didn't make sense. That was the liquid scintillator neutrino detector, LSND for short, which ran from 1993 to 98. The LSND data just wouldn't fit together with all the other data it's normally just excluded from the global fit. In this figure, you see the LSND results from back then. The red and green is what you expect. The dots with the crosses are the data. The blue is the fit to the data. This excess has a statistical significance of 3.8 sigma. As a quick reminder, one sigma is a standard deviation. The more sigmas away from the expectation the data is, the less likely the deviation is to have come about coincidentally. So the more sigma, the more impressive the anomaly. In particle physics, the discovery threshold is 5 sigma. The 3.8 sigma of the LSND anomaly wasn't enough to get excited, but too much to just ignore. So that gives you an outline of the video. I'll put a link to the whole video below. You probably want to watch the whole thing. Uh, like I said, she does a great job explaining the standard model problems. I will say the one thing that I take exception to, to a small degree, is the neutrino oscillation and mixing. Because as I said, in order for a neutrino theory to make logical sense, it has to involve the quantum field. So what's really happening when you have leftover energy, momentum, angular momentum, 
at the end of an interaction and you don't have a particle to take it up, that gets dissipated into the quantum field. And the quantum field has a wave or an oscillation that conserves these quantities until they're reabsorbed somewhere, if ever. So that's the problem. And I don't think that the way it's described in the literature is going to be accepted 100 years from now, but it'll, it'll do for now. Uh, I also want to point out three more problems with the neutrino theory in the standard model. And first being it does not account for how an, an interaction is initiated because neutrinos and W's and Z's don't initiate the interaction. And that the only thing present that could initiate the interaction are quantum fluctuations. And then it do doesn't explain where the energy distribution of the beta particles of the electrons and positrons come from. Why do they have a distribution of energies instead of a single energy? Well, the only way that you can get a distribution of energy like that is if you have a group of objects that have an energy distribution and have a probability distribution curve related to their interaction. So you have to have interaction probabilities and a continuum of, of energy objects. And so that only happens when you have the quantum field. The quantum field has a continuum of energy and an interaction probability. And then as part of that, the peak of the curve is at about 280 MeV per one example that I cite. And it is, if you look at the difference between the mass of the proton and the neutron, it's about 1.3 MeV. And if you subtract the 280, you get 1.02, which is the pair production energy of an electron and positron. So you're looking at the pair production energy being the optimal energy for an interaction particle causing a neutron to decay. And when a neutron decay, a neutron turns into a proton electron, where electron becomes free and the neutron converts to a proton and where the electron-like component in the neutron, which may be a new, just an electron, is annihilated by the positron. So that makes perfect sense that an electron-positron pair at the pair production energy would cause neutrons to decay. And it turns out that if, even if it's close to the pair production energy, you still get a probability of neutron decay occurring. So that all tells us that quantum fluctuations cause the beta decay events to happen using that mechanism. Now with that said, I'll let Sabina continue with her discussion and talk about the actual problem that was de detected and, and possible solutions. So here. Look at this headline from 2007, for example. But then, in 2018, with more data, Mini Boon confirmed the others in D result. Yes, you had that right. They confirmed it with 4.7 sigma with a combined significance of 6 sigma. What does that mean? You can't fit this observation by tweaking the other neutrino mixing parameters. There just aren't sufficiently many parameters to tweak. The observations are just incompatible with the standard model. So you have to introduce something new. Some ideas that physicists have put forward are symmetry violations or new neutrino interactions that aren't in the standard model. There's also, of course, still the possibility that physicists misunderstand something about the experiment itself. But given that this is an independent reproduction of an earlier experiment, I find this unlikely. The most popular idea, which is also the easiest, is what's called sterile neutrinos. A sterile neutrino is one that doesn't have a lepton associated with it and it doesn't have a flavor. So we wouldn't have seen it produced in particle collisions. 
Sterile neutrinos can however still mix into the other neutrinos. Indeed, that would be the only way sterile neutrinos could interact with the standard model particles, and so the only way we can measure them. One sterile neutrino alone doesn't explain the mini Boon Alice and D data, though. You need at least two or more, or something else in addition. Interestingly enough, sterile neutrinos could also make up dark matter. When will we find out? Well, as you can see, the mixing problem has created more problems because it looks like there are more than the three neutrinos in order to solve this problem. And to me that's not a surprise. My last video was talking about how tau particles are not leptons, they're mesons. If you look at their decay products, they decay primarily to pions and based on the decay products it looks like they're made of four pions or two kions. And so they really look like they are mesons. And if you want to try to simplify the elementary particle table, that's a good place to start. I also did a video talking about how muons are essentially a low energy pion and under the Stern glass theory. And so they too are mesons. So what they really should be looking at, if you still want to use the neutrino description and not a quantum field wave description, is you have to have a neutrino for every single particle, and which could be 500 neutrinos. But, but basically you're looking at different energy levels. You're looking at the electron neutrino still at the low energy, you're looking at a muon neutrino, which may also cover the pion at 140 MeV, or maybe there's a pion neutrino. And then you could have a kaon neutrino, which has orbital energy of 210 MeV. Or you can have a charmed neutrino for the charmed baryon orbit, orbital energy of 590. And then the tau neutrino, um, or tau or d meson at 980 MeV, which is also the higher energy charm quark found in mesons typically, but it could also be a low energy bottom quark, which is one reason the quark theory is a mess. And then you could also have a bottom neutrino or B neutrino for the B mesons that has 230 MeV orbit. Because each of these orbital energies has a different angular momenta associated with them and which requires a different neutrino in, in theory. So, in my theory. Um, so anyway, that's what I think could be going on. I'm not an expert in neutrino mixing theory, but based on what I do know about neutrinos, is you, you do end up with a whole bunch of them. And so that's not a big surprise to me. And that's something that, as Sabina says, the commu physics community needs to fix this problem and stop ignoring it. Now, with that said, she didn't make a perfectly clean video without any problems, so I saved the blooper reel for the end. And, in, and I'll, I'll let let her talk. Now, to be fair, neutrino mixing in and by itself isn't all that weird. Indeed, quarks also do this mixing, it's just that they don't mix as much. That neutrinos mix is weird, because neutrinos can only mix if they have masses, but we don't know how they get masses. You see, the way that other elementary particles get masses is that they couple to the Higgs boson. But the way this works is that we need a left-handed and a right-handed version of the particle, and the Higgs needs to couple to both of them together. That works for all particles except the neutrinos, because no one has ever seen a right-handed neutrino. We only ever measure left-handed ones. So the neutrinos mix, which means they must have masses, but we don't know how they get these masses. There are two ways to fix this problem. Either the right-handed neutrinos exist, but they are very heavy, so we haven't seen them yet because creating them would take a lot of energy, 
or the neutrinos are different from all the other spin one half particles in that their left and right handed versions are just the same. This is called a Majorana particle. But either way, something is missing from our understanding of neutrinos. So as you can see, she talks about quarks and quarks are irrational and quark mixing is also irrational by extension. She talks about neutrinos having mass and there's no evidence neutrinos have mass, especially if they're quantum fluctuation oscillations. The, uh, the whole theory that neutrinos mix so they must have mass, you hear repeated over and over and over again, but nowhere, even, not even in the original paper do they explain why that is. And no one can explain it. And then they talk about Higgs boson creating mass. Well, the Higgs boson doesn't. Um, I've shown in papers that the mass of the proton and electron is related to the amount of quantum field energy they displace. So there's nothing to do with the Higgs. Talks about, she talks about left and right handed neutrinos and that is a real problem. And I'd like to get into the left handed neutrino problem. But there are no heavy right handed neutrinos. And Maybe it's a Majorana particle in some sense, but I don't even think that's necessary, in part because they're defined as spin one-half particles, and neutrinos don't conserve spin. I've shown in other videos, so I'll try to link that, is that because the real radius of the proton is larger than the Compton radius, and the Compton radius is what's required to get a spin one-half proton, Protons actually have higher spin. Their angular momenta are closer to 0.7 than 0.5. And the same thing is true for a neutron. Spin are closer to 0.7 than 0.5. So using neutrons to conserve spin at 0.5 minus 0.5 equals 0.5 minus 0.5, you can't do that. That's total nonsense. So that's a whole big problem. And then saying that neutrinos answer the dark matter problem, no, no, they don't have mass, so it, they, they have nothing to do with that. So, as I said, she's still caught in some antiquated science that she hasn't realized is antiquated yet. So I hope you enjoy this video, and if you do, please like, share, and subscribe. And I am selling books on quantum field theory where I describe some problems. I talk about neutrinos in both my quantum field theory books and my particle theory book. So thanks for watching.